And welcome back. We are going to try to finish up Ephesians chapter 6 today in our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through the epistles of Paul in order of when they were written. And uh, last time I, I thought for sure we were going to make it through uh, chapter 6, finish the whole thing. But uh, we, were, we were talking about slavery. We got all the way down there to where it started talking about servants and slavery. And we looked at the order of submission that God set up. Christ is the head and, and the husband is a type of Christ. The wife is under submission to the husband. The children is, are so, so obey and be in submission to their parents. And the servants are supposed to be in submission and obey to those that are above them. And we talked a lot about slavery. And I tried to show you what slavery was really like in the South. And how today you get nothing but propaganda and lies about what the South was like. Remember, only 5% of the South owned slaves. Now the majority of the South were Christians. So of that 5% of Southerners that owned slaves, many of them were Christians. And what we looked at in uh, Ephesians chapter 6 was how God told the servants to obey their masters and, and to serve them as, as they are to serve Christ. And we saw how in chapter 5 of Ephesians, the wife is the type of the church. And uh, she's supposed to obey her husband because the husband is a type of Christ. Well, when we're talking about servants, the servants, what are they a type of? Well, they're a type of the church also. And in type, we see that the church has pastors over them. So really, when you look at a slave owner, and he's a Christian, he is supposed to be more like a pastor over his servant. Because he's supposed to take care of and love his servant. And many of the things today, that when they talk about slavery, all they want to do is talk about the extreme cases of unsaved slave owners being evil and mean and wicked and uh, doing horrible things to their slaves. But that was the lost slave owners. They will not show you the majority of people who owned slaves in the South that were Christians. And they will not show you what the way the Bible said that slavery was supposed to go. So we looked at last time how servants were to be obedient to their own masters and everything and serve their masters for by doing so they are serving God. But then we looked at verse 9 where it says, And ye masters do the same things unto them, forbearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there any respect of persons with him. So a man who was a slave owner was supposed to be like a pastor to his slaves and treat them righteously, treat them justly, not threaten them, not beat them, not treat them horrible. And I told you a little bit last time about how they actually loved them. Remember the wet nurse? What was a wet nurse? A woman whose husband owned slaves, most of the time in the South, there was a black slave woman that when she had that baby, that woman, the black woman, became a wet nurse to that white baby. And that black woman breastfed that baby. Yeah, that, that shows how hateful the white people are, doesn't it? Well, if they really were racist and hateful, they wouldn't let a black woman uh, um, breastfeed their child, would they? No, most of the time they felt like one big family. And the kids loved their parents because they were family. And the servants loved their masters because they treated them with love. Because they were commanded to by the Bible. And so that's what it says here. Let's see. Go to Colossians with me. Chapter 3. And, and right there it says, Servants, obey in all things your masters. I'm in verse 22. According to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. So the servants were to obey their masters, just as children are to obey their parents, just as the wife is supposed to submit and obey her husband. Now go to Colossians 4, verse 1. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. So this man that would have owned a slave in America in the 1800s was supposed to be just. Chose to treat these, these servants as equal. And if you look at it that way, he was supposed to treat them as a pastor would preach his church. 
You see, he'd be the pastor over the flock. So a true Bible-believing Christian slave owner, and there were millions, well, maybe not millions, but, but thousands, probably hundreds of thousands, who did try to follow the Bible, they treated their servants right. And yet today, all they want you to remember were the lost slave owners that lived in the South that treated them wrong. Yet we've read verse after verse of how they were supposed to treat them nice and forbear threatening and not be mean to them. And we looked at last time how many a slave owner only had them work seven months out of the year and gave them five months off. There's an old movie, and I don't know if I recommend movies too much, but this one was made in the 50s by Disney. It's called Song of the South. My dad got a copy of that uh, years ago, and I watched it because I remember seeing it as a kid. And it was pretty interesting. Uncle Remus, a black man. And it showed what the Old South was really like, how these children oftentimes would play with the servants. They would, they would call the black older men their uncles, Uncle Remus, go fishing together. They'd do things together. They, they function together as a family. Because why would you treat your servant bad when the Bible told you not to? And many of the people in the South were Christians. But today, no, they don't want you to know that. They don't want you to know the truth. They want you to think that it's evil to own a slave, which I don't like that idea of owning a slave, and that any person that owned a slave was evil, and that the only people that ever owned slaves in the history of the world were black people being owned by white people. Well, we looked at last time that, no, 400 years, Jews were slaves to black people in Egypt. No! Uh, throughout the history of, of, of what went on in the world, the Romans and the Greeks owned slaves, and they were whites owning whites. No! There are Muslims today all over the world that practice slavery. So if you want to be called an abolitionist and say you hate slavery, why aren't you against the Muslims? No, you just want to be a person that hates black, uh, white people and claim to be on the side of civil rights for blacks. So, what we need to do is we need to look at the entire history of slavery. We need to look at the Bible. What does the Bible say about it? Now, thank God there's no slavery today, even though in Muslim countries there still is. So, why even bring this up? There was a, an article I read the other day about this black man named Snoop Dogg. And he was on uh, some show, and he was saying, Man, I'm sick of this garbage. They're showing Roots on TV. Now, if you don't know what Roots is, it's some, is it by Alex Haley or somebody? It's a book. And in that book, it demonizes white slave owners and makes them all evil. Even though we've looked at there were many Christian ones, that if it hadn't been for them owning the slaves, the slaves would have never heard the gospel and gotten saved. Well, this show, this book Roots, was made into a, a movie years ago, and, and all it's supposed to do is stir up hate and make people hate white people. Well, they've remade Roots, and they're showing it on TV now. And this black guy, Snoop Dogg, said, man, I'm so sick of this. He's a black guy. He says, why do you keep throwing this in our face? Why do you keep bringing this up? I think that's so funny. He's some rapper. I mean, he's, he's pure evil. Every other word's a dirty word that he says. But at least he's got enough guts to say, why don't you shut up about all that stuff? He says, we're black. We've done a lot of good things. Why do you keep throwing in our face that <laughs> when we were down and all this stuff? So yeah, why? Why do you keep trying to bring that up and, and remind us of that? Okay, if you want to keep reminding us of the poor black people that were slaves, then why don't we look at what really happened? Why don't we look at in the Bible how these people that were the owners were to treat the slaves not just as servants, but they were supposed to serve them as well and be good masters that were just and treated them as equals. And uh, according to Ephesians chapter 6, forbear threatening and doing the same things unto them, which is what? Treating them right, treating them as Christ would treat the church. So that's what the Bible had to say about slavery. And you'll remember that... Uh, I told you about a documentary I watched about how 80% of the people in the South said they were happier being slaves than being free. Because under slavery, they had someone that loved them and took care of them and provided for them. And they had seven months to work, but five months free. They had a house. But once the government freed them, well, they didn't have anything or anything to do. They didn't know what to do. They hadn't been trained to do certain things. 
And many of them said, when we're starving, we don't have much. Well, the government steps in, we're going to give you land, we're going to give you this. And, and from then on, it's been a perpetual handout from the government for many people. Sometimes the best thing the government can do is just get the heck out of the way, you know? And let people live their lives, let them have true freedom. And yet, now today, there's many people that are enslaved to the government, that are on welfare, that can't make it on their own, so they have to live like this the rest of their lives. So many people have said that a lot of black people today are still slaves, and they're on the government plantation rather than on a, a, a private citizen's plantation. That's really sad. So God doesn't see color. God is no respecter of persons, we saw here in verse 9. Neither is there any respect of persons with him. So as a Christian myself, when I see someone, I don't see black or white. What I ask is, are you a Christian or are you lost? And if you're lost, get saved. If you are saved, praise God. So let's put all that behind us, the slavery, and let's continue on here. But the Bible has a lot to say about slavery. And uh, one thing I thought was interesting, and I didn't mention this last time, last time, but under the law, even under the law of Moses... Slavery was allowed. And you go to the Old Testament, there was, just as I told you, there was indentured servitude in, in the uh, time of America, where a person became a slave for so many years. In the Old Testament, you became a slave, and after so many years, you were set free. But it says that if a person wanted to be a slave for life, there was something that was to take place. They were to take that person, and they drill a hole through their ear right here with an all, it says, and that marked a person as a slave for life. So under the law, if you ever came across somebody with a big hole in their ear, you know, oh, that guy was a manservant to so-and-so for life. How odd. But yet there were certain people that wanted to be slaves because they had super rich masters, and those masters loved them and took care of them and, and gave them some of their riches. They go, you know, I'm just going to serve him for life because this is, this is a cushiony job. <laughs> this is nice. And uh, there's some people, I think Eliezer uh, was a servant of uh, Abraham or Isaac. Maybe both in the Old Testament. So I wonder if he would have had a hole in his ear if that was the custom during those times. So let's move on from slavery um, <clears throat> and go to, uh, well, let's start in verse 10. But i got to back up to one more thing, 2 Timothy 2.21. 2 Timothy 2.21. i got to finish this up, this one verse on slavery. And then we'll continue here. Second Timothy. See, a lot of people don't like to talk about slavery. I'm not afraid to talk about it. If the Bible says it, I'll preach it and teach it. If you're not afraid to do it, then I'm not afraid to preach against it if the Bible is against it. That's just the way that a minister is supposed to be. If the Bible says it, we're supposed to preach it. So let's deal with the issue of slavery for real. And what we find in the Bible and in history is that when people talk about slavery today and want to only talk about slavery of blacks during and before the Civil War, all they're trying to do is cause hatred and division. But if you look at it in its proper context, biblically, and how Christians really treated slaves, there was love there. What they don't have today is love. Now in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 21, we read, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel in honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, talking about God, and prepared unto every good work. So according to the Bible, and I don't have time to go into any of the other passages, but Jesus Christ is the master. You know what that means? That means that we are the slave. So if you really want to talk about slavery, every Christian is supposed to be a servant of Jesus Christ. So let's talk about slavery, huh? Well, guess what? I, Robert Breaker, am a slave to Christ. I am his servant. I am his son, sure, but I'm also a servant because he is my master. So if a Christian would have owned a slave back in the 1800s, he would have read his Bible if he was saved and knew that. And he would have known, yes, they're supposed to work for me, but they're also my equal in Christ because we're both sons of God. So rather than him going around beating and, and slapping and, 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 and 
cutting off his toes with axes and treating them like garbage. If you study like I did, my third great grandfather, who was a Christian, who got a lot of black people saved, he actually owned a couple of slaves, but he also won them to the Lord, and he treated them like family. He treated them like a pastor preaches, uh, uh, treats his church. He saw himself as Christ in the church, and that we are the slaves and he's the master. He, he would have treated them with love and respect. So we truly are slaves to Christ if we're saved. We're His servants, and we're supposed to serve Him with love. So if you would have owned slaves in the 1800s and you had that perspective, you probably would have treated your slaves very, very well. I'll just leave it at that. Because you would have read, Also in heaven, your master, neither is there any respect of persons with him. Hey, however you treat your slave... Jesus says, that's how I'm going to treat you. So you abuse your slave, God in heaven's kind of going, <clears throat> yeah, things aren't going to be very easy for you pretty soon, because I see how you're treating them. Same way with a wife. If a man treats his wife bad, there's a verse in the Bible that says his prayers will be hindered if he's not doing right with his wife. God is looking at this man who's in charge. You, you know, people say it's horrible that a man is in charge of the wife, and the man is the head, and he rules. Uh, no, actually, it's kind of scary <laughs> because the man in charge is the one that gives account. So if a man treats his wife wrong, someday he's going to give account to it, uh, to God for it. If a man treats his slave wrong, someday he's going to give account to God for it. So there's more pressure on a man to do right, and sometimes that's hard. So laying back behind us all this thing about slavery, let's continue in Ephesians chapter 6, and verse 10. He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, the one with all the power is God. So let's be strong in His power. I looked up the term, be strong, and found it was 36 times in 32 verses in the, in the New Testament. And a lot of times when it says be strong, it says be courageous right after it. So have courage. So how are we strong in the Lord? Well, we're strong in the Lord by having courage. How do we have courage? By knowing the truth and knowing what the Bible says. And by having truth, we can be courageous because we know we're right because the Bible says so. Another thing, I looked up just two verses real quick that talk about being strong. How do we be strong in the Lord? Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, be strong. Now when it says quit ye be my, like men, it means carry through until the end. So that means till you die, be a man and be strong. Well that begs the question, what is it to be a man? Let's go to 2 Timothy 2.1. Here's another place where it says be strong. We'll look at that in a second, what it means to be a man. I had somebody email me not so long ago and said, would you please preach a message on how to be a man? And I thought about that for a long time and I'm like, wow. Well, that's a good question. You know, a lot of people in this world that aren't saved, they think a man is the guy that cusses the loudest and the best, the guy that drinks the most, the guy that fornicates the most. They think that's what makes a man. No, that makes a sinful man. <laughs> but what makes a godly man? Let's go to 2 Timothy 2.1. Talking about be strong. We saw in verse 10, he said, be strong in the Lord. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.1 says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So be strong in grace. So a man, according to the Bible, a man is someone with grace. So the more grace you have proves that you're more of a man. Well, then let's go back to slavery, which I don't really want to do. But a true man that owns slaves, that means he put up with them. He didn't go beat them and chop their feet off with axes like in that book and movie Roots. A true man shows grace towards others. Why? Because he's a type of Christ. And Christ Jesus showed grace to the world by dying for their sins. Boy, what grace he had knowing every sin that I'd ever do. And yet he still sacrificed himself and died for me. So a true man shows grace. A true man shows sacrifice. You go back a couple videos ago when we went through chapter 5 and we looked at the type of Christ in the church. What did I tell you? That in the marriage relationship, 
the best way to describe it is a man sacrifices for his wife and the wife submits to the husband. Because Jesus sacrificed himself for us and he asks us to submit to him. So what makes a man? Well, thinking about that, I don't want to get too in deep in that, but go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Here Paul says, you man of God. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11. 1 Timothy 6, 11, he says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, where until thou art called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. So there's a lot of things here that he says makes a man. A thing that makes a man is that he's righteous. He tries to do what's right. That's what makes a man. What else makes a man? Well, a man is somebody buddy, who uh, lives godly. He's righteous. He has faith. Does it say there? Faith. He's got God in his faith, love, patience. Look at this, patience. Well, that's a hard one sometimes to have. Now, if you go back, and I love the Old South. I was born and raised in the South. I love to read the Old South. I've read lots of history books about the South. You go back to the Old South. Yes, there was slavery. But there was also chivalry. Do you know what chivalry is? Chival is that old teaching back when there was knights, you know, and the guy storms the castle and fights the dragon, you know. Um, by the way, uh, we're going to look at this in a minute. A, a man fights. But chivalry, the Old South, they, they loved chivalry. In the Old South, they read the old books about the knights and the castles. And one of the things that distinguished the people from the South from the North is that they wanted to be chivalrous. They wanted to live honest, and they believed in honor. And in the South, I spelled it with the old U, like the, the, Spanish, the spelling in the England. But in the South, there was a code of honor. And if you were a Southern man, you were raised from an early age to be godly, righteous, and have patience and love, and sacrifice and grace. And you prided yourself on how good you were and how honorable you were. That today is still called Southern hospitality. In the South, you know, before the Civil War, they said, well, people in the South are some of the sweetest, nicest people because most of them were Christians that accepted the gospel, that read the Bible, that understood these things. And many of them love to read and they love to read books and chivalry. And you go to many schools in the South, and they would actually teach the Greek and the Hebrew language, and they would teach the Bible. And they would teach you so you would read in Greek, so you could read the ancient Greek classics. You know, all the stories of uh, Aesop's fables and things like that. They all had a moral code. So the South was all about living a moral life. Don't fornicate. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't cheat. That was the Christian moral. And moral, morale, and morale too. That was the Christian morals that were of the South. Now the Civil War was over. They defeated the South. And yet today people say, oh, I love Southern hospitality. Yeah, what is Southern hospitality? Where does that come from? Most people have no idea. But most people who have traveled America will say, well, I live up in New York and people there are mean. You walk down the street and you say hi to somebody, they go, Pfft and walk away because it's not nice to say hi to people. People live in their own worlds and they look at others and just look down on them or whatever. They're not nice. But I went down to Atlanta or I went down to, to such and such a place and man, they were just so nice. You walk down the street and people say, howdy, how you doing? <laughs> why, why is there such a difference between the North and the South? Why does the North seem cold and the now South seem nice? You know what it is? It's the saturation of the gospel of Jesus Christ being preached in the South for so many years that people for so many years in the South believing in, in what makes a man is how moral he is and how honorable he is and believing that this is what makes a man that people were nice and hospitable and treated others with dignity and respect. To this day, they remember Southern hospitality. 
Now you want to lie to me and tell me that every man in the South that owns a slave is just like the movie Roots? Then why do you have Southern hospitality? Wouldn't it be the other way around? Wouldn't everybody in the North be the hospitable nice ones and the South be the demons from hell that are so mean because they treat their slaves like crap? Uh, no, it's the other way around from what they're trying to teach today. Today they teach that the white man in the South is an evil devil for owning slaves. We saw that 5% owned slaves in the South. And of that 5%, very few were lost people. And oftentimes, lost people that were slave owners treated their slaves like garbage because they refused to follow the Bible. But the majority of the southern people were godly Christian folks that believed that what made a man was a man had grace, he sacrificed, he tried to live a righteous, godly life with faith, love, and patience, he fought for what was right, he was honorable, and he sought to show himself as an honorable, moral person to others. If that is the case, and it is, then how do you think that men who owned slaves treated their servants? That explains why 80% of all the volumes in the Library of Congress of all the ex-slaves, 80% of them said they were happier as slaves than being free. Because they lived around honorable, decent, Christian human beings. So... We are told a pack of lies today because the government, the victor, the North, is trying to tell you that the South was slave owners and the reason for the Civil War was slavery and the North were the great victors that conquered and got rid of the horrible institution of slavery and those evil Southern people. When you study the Civil War, you find out the North is the evil, vile, wicked, corrupt devils who tried to pass the Morrill Tariff, M-O-R-R-I-L-L, -L, not M-O-R-A-L, which was a tariff in which they tried to tax the South of almost 40% of everything they owned. And the North was gaining popularity and people, and they wanted to attack and dominate the South. Because the South was making more money. You see, the South could grow crops, and the South was making more money than the North, because the growing period in the South was more than in the North. Well, the North eventually became uh, an, uh, not agricultural, but industrial. And the North began to get money from the industry up North. But for a long time, the South had more money than the North. Now, why would that be? Think about that for a second. Could it be because the Christian folk in the South, serving God and following His way, were blessed of God? <laughs> That's why they were richer and had more money? Could, could that be a possibility? And could it be that the North was suffering? Because in the North there were Catholics, Unitarians, and Universalists. All three of those began to preach things that were against the Bible. I told you last time that we went through and looked at the Ten Commandments, how the Catholics took the Second Commandment and took it out of the Bible and divided the Tenth Commandment into two. Do you think God will bless any religion that starts cutting things out of the Bible? The Universalists, the Unitarians, they started preaching this doctrine. I've studied this in history. This is, this is incredible to me and also sick. The Universalists, the Unitarians, were a denomination up north that began to teach the unity of man. And what they taught was that all men are the sons of God. They're all the children of God. No, the Bible says you must be born again and have a spiritual birth to become a son of God. But they don't believe that. And up north, they began to teach against the gospel. The Unitarians and Universalists said, the idea of a just God dying for the unjust is sick. And they said, every person has to pay for their own crime. And to say that God, a just God, would die for an unjust person, and that an unjust person would never have to pay for their crimes, is a horrible teaching. And I can't remember the words they used or what they called it, but they began, they began to mock and make fun of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about the nor northern Yankee people. And the South said, well, we have nothing of that because this is the salvation. This is what's so great about salvation is that we don't have to pay for our sins. But the North preached the doctrine and the gospel of works for salvation, and the South preached salvation by faith alone without works. And the Civil War happened for many reasons, many of which were spiritual. 
It was Satan wanting to destroy a gospel-saturated South of just good, godly people. And history is, is over. It's all done. But it's really sad. So when you begin studying all that, you'll find out why the South was so wonderful. Because people prided themselves on being honorable, decent, Christian, moral people. And preaching and believing the gospel. As opposed to the Yankees in the North that said... Oh, well, we're Catholic, which means we can do certain things. We can sin. As long as we go to confession, we're fine. And, and we don't have to be nice. And, you know, we want money, so we'll tax you. And we don't believe in this gospel of salvation by faith alone. That's dumb. And you really, really start to see why the North and the South went to war. It wasn't just about slavery. It was about the moral tariff and many other things. States' rights. It was about states' rights. All right, so go to... Uh, Ephesians chapter 6. 10. Finally, but up my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. So we be strong in the Lord. How? We be strong and be men, Paul Saul told us. What makes us men? These are some of the things that makes a man a true man. But one of the things that makes a man a man is that he fights. Whenever the Civil War broke out, there was a thing called the, the rebel yell. And the South knew they were right. They were fighting a foreign country that was invading them. They were Christians that were fighting for the gospel and for truth and the way of God and the doctrines of God. And the South, when they fought, they had no fear. And the North said it scared them to death when they went to battle with the South because of what they called the rebel yell. And the rebel yell goes something like this. Yeah! <laughs> uh, it's kind of like what you used to see on the Dukes of Hazard when I was a kid, you know. They're jumping in their Dukes of Hazard car. Yeah! But it was more like, yeah! It was a lot of almost like an Indian yell when the Indians went into battle. Can you imagine coming down to fight in the Battle of Bull Run? And uh, you're standing out there, and you're from the north, and you're told, you know, to go kill those southerners. And those southerners marched right out and went, Wah! as loud as they could, and they're all screaming. I mean, it is said in some history books that some of those Yankees, they literally pissed their britches and turned around and ran. They were so scared. It, it, it makes you prideful almost to be from the south, to be from an honorable Christian background of righteous, godly Christians who trusted the gospel, who, who fought for what they believed in. It almost makes you glad. Amen. But that's all in the past. Or is it? You see, a lot of people want to bring it up and want to bring up slavery. Okay, if we're going to bring it up, let's bring up what society was like in that time. Well, what was it like? Why, it was a Bible society where men felt, followed the Word of God. And in the Bible saturated, gospel saturated South, men wanted to live honorable, moral lives and be real men, types of Christ when the men up north did not. Many were Catholic or Unitarian or Universalist and they didn't stand for anything. So if you don't stand for anything, you'll fall for... If you don't stand for something, you'll, you'll fall for anything. So many northern folks were corrupt. The northern government was a corrupt system. Corrupt government, corrupt people, many corrupt men up north. <sighs> Whatever. But a lot of people say, I don't believe that. Okay, just study it yourself. Just read books like I have. And you'll understand why we have Southern hospitality remembered to this day. The Bible tells us as Christians to be hospitable. Well, the South wanted to follow the Bible verbatim, word by word, when the North oftentimes would rather follow religion and man's teaching than the Bible. So back to 6.10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Verse 11, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now here, we get what the Bible calls the armor of God. And this is quite in interesting because we're talking about the context of fighting. What makes a man? Paul said, I have fought the good, God, good fight of faith. A man fights. Every man has within him this desire to fight. And if he's a moral man, he wants to fight for what's right. If he's an immoral man, he wants to fight others just so he can exalt himself. Well, a true man of God, who's godly and righteous, wants to fight for the truth of the gospel so that Christ will be exalted. But Christian men 
want to fight for what's right. Now, what Paul's about to talk about here in verses 11 through 17 is the armor of God. And what Paul did is he looked at a first century foot soldier. And he tells us all the things that those Roman soldiers had. He said, what they have physically, you should have spiritually as a Christian. Which means a Christian is a soldier. Now, here's another thing. <laughs> I can't get away from slavery today. A Christian has to fight for the truth. So Paul says that Christians are soldiers of Jesus Christ. Now, it's a spiritual battle that we're to fight, not a physical one. Our weapons of our warfare are, warfare are not carnal. But there was a time, especially in the Civil War, in which the South said, okay, our weapons are carnal, because these Unitarian Universalist Catholics up north want to come down and dictate to us Christians what we can and can't do. We're going to have to fight to protect ourselves from not only they're trying to tax us without representation, but they're also trying to kill us and feed us false doctrine. Well, <clears throat> basically, we're soldiers. Now, I said I can't get away from slavery. Do you know that during the Civil War, and I've read a lot of books around the Civil War, that there were many black soldiers that fought for the South, and many of them were not told by their servant, uh, by their masters to do so? They told their masters, I will not leave your side. I will fight with you. If you look at many a southern soldier, there's many a black Confederate soldier buried in many Confederate cemeteries around America. Southern soldiers fighting for their masters. But they weren't fighting for their masters. They were fighting for their country alongside their masters as equals because they loved their country and they loved God. Something they don't tell you about in school. You know what's interesting? I went to a good school when I went to Baghdad Elementary School and Hobbs Middle School. I remember a teacher, I forget her name, but I remember sitting in her class. And we're sitting here studying history. And we get to the Civil War and she said, I just want you all to know something. The South was right. And that the Civil War was all about states' rights. And she went through and explained all this to us in a secular government school. I couldn't believe it. It was amazing. And she told us the truth about the Civil War. I wish they'd teach the truth today. Well, anyway, <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 6, Paul is talking about armor. And he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, 2 Corinthians 10.4 tells us what our weapons are. Let's look at that real quick. 2 Corinthians 10.4, I believe I quoted that earlier, but I like to read the whole verse. 2 Corinthians, I'm in first. 2 Corinthians 10.4. You say, are you proud to be from the South? Well, pride is a bad thing. The Bible tells us not to be prideful. How about I'm just blessed to have been raised in an area where the gospel was preached for so many years. And uh, because of that, there's lots of Christians, and I know what it is to be a Christian, and I know what it is to be a man. And I've been blessed to have men in my life, uncles, fathers, uh, just friends of my dad, others that have taught me what it is to be a good man, a good godly Christian man. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10.4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but it says, but mighty through, the, through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So our warfare is a spiritual warfare. We're about to see what this spiritual warfare is. It's not, it's not taking up arms and fighting physically. Hope to God we never have to get there like they did in the south. But we're fighting a spiritual battle. What are we fighting against? Well, go back to Ephesians chapter 6, and he tells us in the very next verse. Well, let me read 11 again. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the walls of the devil. One thing I want to write down up here is that a true godly Christian stands for the truth. Now, I'm going to get into that in a minute because this passage tells us three times to stand. To stand. To stand. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell a Christian to attack. It tells a Christian to stand. And if you look at those Roman soldiers and their armor, I've studied a lot about the Roman soldiers and the way they set them up. They had a long spear and they had a gigantic shield. And the way the Roman soldiers won every battle wasn't that one man ran out and started slashing and attacking. They stuck together and they stood. And over and over they withstood the enemy and slowly moved forward. And withstood the attack and move forward until they conquered. So one of the secrets as a Christian to, is to stand for the truth. 
You don't go run around attacking. You stand. You stand. It says here in verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now this is such a revealing verse. And what's interesting too is he says, For we wrestle. Verse 11, he says, put on the armor of God. He likens a Christian unto two figures here, a soldier and a wrestler. And one thing I hated was wrestling. When I was in high school, I could have joined the wrestling team, and I went out one day and watched them. I said, I don't want that. A bunch of two sweaty guys just rolling on top of each other, trying to get and all the sweat rubbing off and smelling the armpits and everything. And I looked at it and said, I don't want to be a wrestler. It does not appeal to me whatsoever to wrestle. But in wrestling, you're that close to the enemy. And you're trying to get the advantage. And as a soldier, when he talks about fighting, he doesn't say attack. He says stand. So you're supposed to stand for the truth. And you wrestle. Well, how's the best way to wrestle? Well, you wrestle in prayer as a Christian. But it says we wrestle against what? principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now how revealing is that? That sounds like the government. Principalities. Why? Well, principality was someone in power. Power, someone in power. Rulers. So the people in control, literally, of the government, and then it says spiritual wickedness in high places. So what Paul is telling us is the literal people in charge of the government, which were the Gentiles, they are led by spiritual wickedness in high places. What does that mean? That means Satan is behind those people and is letting them have power. Why? Because Satan is the god of this world, we are told. Now let me find my notes here. Let's go to Ephesians 2.2. 2. Back when we were in Ephesians chapter 2, I, I, I mentioned this quickly. But Ephesians 2.2, 2, look what it says here. Now, in, in 6.12 it says, Spiritual wickedness in high places. Now go to Ephesians 2.2. 2. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So there is a satanic spirit that goes according to the prince of the power of the air. Who is the prince of the power of the air? Well, obviously that's Satan. So the god of this world is the devil. And he gets in power through taking over governments and putting through his agenda. We looked at last time how the whole agenda of the world system is to go against the way that God set up this system of submission. And that's exactly what they're doing today. Satan takes over governments to go against God in the Bible. That's his plan. And it always has been. That's why so many Christians have been killed throughout history by evil, wicked, ungodly um, governing bodies that always follow Satan and kill the righteous. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. I'll begin there in verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Verse 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Look what it says about the God of this world, which by the way is Satan. It's a little g, God of this world. That little g is Satan. And even though Jesus Christ is God, he sits in heaven, and his kingdom is a spiritual kingdom today. It's the kingdom of God. But the physical kingdom on this earth is Satan's. And he is actively working as hard as he can today so that when the rapture takes place, he has the whole world under his submission in the new world order. And that is the devil's plan of attack, and always has been, that he would take over the governments of the world and run things the way He wants to run them. Thankfully, God's on our side, and often throughout history, many Christians were able to live and to preach the truth and win others to Jesus Christ and had relative freedom, especially in America, but not always. If you look at the history of the world, especially from when the church started, many Christians were murdered, thrown to the lions, 
uh, in Rome, they were, they were uh, killed in the Colosseum. You see, the devil's goal is to kill Christians and to use secular governments to do it. Now let's look at Russia. The communists took over Russia, made the churches register with the state, shut down all the churches. There's a book by Richard Rembrandt that you can read about how he was tortured for Christ by the secular, pagan, godless communist government. Look at China. The communists, the Boxer Rebellion, the communists came in, took over. They became the god, the state. Now, today, you can't have a church in China. They kill Christians, they have, and they'll continue to do so. Now we see other countries around the world. They become communists, they kick out God. America's becoming communist. They're trying to get the churches to register with the state. Then they're going to kill them. That's the goal of Satan. Can't you see it? I mean, it's right there in your face. Get rid of God and the Bible and the Gospel. So back to Ephesians chapter 6. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. No, we don't. We wrestle against demons. The Bible tells us in the last days there will be doctrines of devils and seducing spirits. So what do we as Christians do that want to be righteous and godly and, and be patient and decent, good, upstanding, honorable, moral people? We have to stand for what the Bible teaches. Stand for the truth. So that the devil doesn't take over and kick God out. We have to stand. How do we stand? Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wiles means trickery. The devil wants to trick everybody. And so he's fi uh, working hard to try to attack Christianity. So you go down to verse 13. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. Okay? So verse 11 he says stand. Verse 13, the end of the verse says stand. Verse 14, stand therefore. So three times we're told in the Bible, stand. Actually four if you take verse 13, the word withstand. But that's withstand means to resist. So I'm only counting the three times that it says stand. Three times in the Bible God says stand. Well, how do I stand? I stand on the word of God, unwavering. I will not back up. I will not move. This is what God says and I stand on it. I will not change for you or anyone. I have to go by what God says. Stand. So verse 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Well, I think we're in the evil day. What do you think? The Bible says in the last days there will be perilous times. Well, these are the last days of the church, so we're in the evil day. We're in the day of evil. We're in the day in which some people think the Antichrist is starting to, to reign and rule. And uh, it says we're, we're supposed to withstand, and having done all, stand. So there's many things that you can do, but when there's nothing else you can do, stand. Now we talked a little bit last time about how America was founded. And Americans, they fought the British because they wanted freedom to serve God, not freedom to sin. We looked at that last time. Well, how did they do it? The Battle of Bunker Hill. Have you ever studied history? The American soldiers went out and they actually fought the battle, but not on Bunker Hill. They fought on Breed's Hill. If you ever go out there and take a tour, like I did before in Boston, they'll tell you that. If you read uh, William Grady's book, What Hath God Wrought, he'll explain that. To this day, we remember the Battle of Bunker's Hill. But uh-oh, so sorry, it was not fought on Bunker's Hill, it was fought on Breed's Hill. So why did they remember it as the Battle of Bunk Bunker's Hill? Good question. They sat out there on Breed's Hill and they stood. And they were told, we will withstand the assault because we will stand for our rights. And they fought against the British and they stood on Breed's, Breed's Hill. But up on Bunker's Hill, a little farther away, there was a Baptist, I think he was a Baptist, there was a minister of God that was praying through the whole battle. And he was praying, God, save us! Protect us from the evil, the principalities, the rulers of the darkness of this world against this spiritual wickedness, against this, this evil, evil king. And all the early Americans, many of which were Christians who believed the gospel, they said that the real battle took place on Bunker's Hill, where the man was praying for the battle to be won. To the, man, I'm getting goosebumps. I love history. They said that's where the true battle was fought. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So today, in the history books, the Battle of Bunker Hill, because they remembered the man praying 
not just the battle that took place. Whew. That's something, ain't it? So those men stood and fought the British. Wow. You say, well, they didn't win. Oh, but it was quite the victory because they withstood and killed a lot of British soldiers. Sure, they had to flee a little bit. But over the next five, six years, the battle was won. What did they do? They stood. Verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. So there's some things we need to do. Now let me back up before I continue here talking about the armor of God. Let's go to uh, verse 11 again. Put on the whole armor of God. I looked up the word armor in the Bible and found out that it shows up about four or five times. And I thought it was interesting. Let's go to three different verses where it talks about the armor of God. And it shows us what the armor is. Romans chapter 13 and verse 12. I've got to show you this. I don't want to forget this. Romans chapter 13 and verse 12 says, Sorry, I skip around so much. Sometimes I just read over my notes. Romans 13, 12 says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. So it's called the armor of light. What is light? Light is the Bible. Light is truth. If you just keep on preaching the truth, you've got on an armor. And you can just preach the truth and just continue preaching the truth. And that's part of the armor of God. You see, the devil lies. He's the father of it. So somebody's got to be preaching the truth. You know you can't kill truth? Oh, you might be able to suppress it, but the truth always comes out. So stand for the truth. 2 Corinthians 6, 7, look at this. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Here we're told about the armor of righteousness. Now I told you, I told you right, that the whole culture of the South was all about being an honorable, moral person and just living a righteous, pure life, doing right. That's what the South wanted to do. That's what they taught the young men to be, is be righteous, honorable people. So the armor of righteousness, by doing right and living holy, you don't give the devil much to, to say against you. That's an armor in itself by just doing right. Part of the armor of God. So back to Ephesians chapter 6. Here where it's called the armor of God in verse 11. And also in verse 13. The whole armor of God. So it's interesting that three times we talk about armor in the Bible. Once it's the armor of light. Once it's the armor of righteousness. Once it's the armor of God. So it's God's light and His righteousness. So if you think about what the armor of God is, it's being saved. Because when you're saved, how do you get saved? By hearing the truth. You have to hear the gospel. You have to hear the Bible. The Bible, the light. See the light of the gospel. We read the verse, the light of the glorious gospel. Once you see and hear and understand and believe the gospel, and you're saved, then God imputes to you His righteousness. Guess what? You have on God's armor. It's the armor of God. So being saved is the first most important thing. You're not even in the army if you're not saved. You're not even a soldier. So you must be saved. So back to 14. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. Now what is the truth? The Bible. The Word of God. And the loins is, is from your waist down to your knees. That's pretty much your loins. And I've always thought about that and I couldn't figure that out. Having your loins girt with truth. Having your, I don't understand that. One time a, a brother that was in Bible school with me, he goes, well think about it. Just sit down. So I sat down. He goes, now that you're sitting down, where's your loins? And I looked down and he goes, I said, well that's my lap. He goes, right, so your loins are your wrap. Now he says, now here's the Bible, put this in your lap. And so I put the Bible in my lap, and I looked down, and <laughs> the Bible was over my loins. And I just thought, wow, my loins are girt with the truth. By sitting down in a chair with the Bible in my lap, I have my loins girded about with truth. And I thought, man, that, and I've never forgot that. That explains that verse to me perfectly, having your loins, learned, loins girded about with truth, sitting down, reading the Bible in your lap. And having on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate goes around your chest. Well, you trust Jesus from the heart, by faith. And when you trust Him, He imputes His righteousness to you. So that's like having a breastplate of righteousness. You're righteous through Christ, by faith, by trusting the gospel. Fifteen, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. 
It's interesting that in Romans chapter uh, 15 and verse, uh, excuse me, chapter 10 and verse 10, 15, it says, "How beautiful are the feet of them which preach the gospel." So your gospel, your feet should always be prepared to go anywhere and preach the gospel. One time I was in a church in Tennessee and I was at a missions conference years ago. And the night before, I gave my testimony in that church. And when I did, the pastor just, man, I remember him getting up going, man, that's the clearest presentation I've ever heard of the gospel. He said, man, that was good. And I remember going to eat afterwards in the fellowship hall, and I was sitting right behind. I was at this table, and the pastor was at that table. And I remember the pastor saying, man, did you hear that boy give his testimony tonight? That was the clearest presentation of the gospel I've ever heard. That was so good. And I just kind of went, what? Amen. <laughs> Well, that evening, about 7.30 in the morning, I was sleeping. A bunch of other missionaries were sleeping at this missions conference. The pastor comes in and he says, Brother Breaker, we have a man in the hospital dying right now. And I've got to go do something. He said, I thought about it and I said, who could I call out of all these missionaries to go give a clear presentation of the gospel to that man? He said, I thought of you after your testimony last night. Would you go to the hospital? Would you go meet this man, James? And would you win him to Jesus? I said, yes, sir, Pastor. I got dressed as fast as I could and took off to the direction of the hospital and the room number and everything he told me and won that man to the Lord on his deathbed. What was that? That was having my feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And what a blessing to see that man get saved. You know what? His family was so thankful they gave us a blanket. I still have that blanket today. It was a hand-stitched blanket of an American flag that a woman took all this time to make. And that's a prized possession of mine, I believe. All because my feet were foreshod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Verse 16, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Defensive weapon, a shield. Remember, we stand for the truth. See, a lot of Christians today, they don't care about having the armor. All they want to do is go attack others. And I've said it many times that many Christians, all they do is attack one another. And the devil just goes, I don't have to mess with them. They're over there fighting themselves. I'll go, I'll go do some other chicanery. <laughs> I'll go do some other wickedness. When if we were all standing, he couldn't get through. But oh no, a lot of Christians have to go fight one another. That's sad. Very sad. Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now the sword of the Spirit, the Bible is likened to a sword in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse Hebrews 4.12. You go to Hebrews chapter 4.12, look what it says here. The Bible, the Word of God. For the Word of God is quick, Hebrews 4.12, and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing and sunder, asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is the discernment of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Whew, the Bible is like a two-edged sword. Are, are you getting the theme here, how important it is to have the Bible? Now, which Bible? The King James... I don't have time to go into that today, but unless you have the King James, you don't even have a Bible. All other versions come from different texts that are corrupted by men. And they're not from the text that the Bible says is where the Bible should come from. So the King James is the sword. 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now I forgot in verse 14... When I was talking about stand, I wanted to talk about stand again. Let me talk about stand. What does it mean to stand? Stand means you resist. You don't attack. You see, God wants us to be defensive. There's a time to earnestly contend for the faith, like it says in Jude. But we are to resist and stand for the truth. And we go to James chapter 4. And the Bible tells us that the devil's going to attack, and we just saw what it says there, that he's going to throw his fiery darts, so we need to have the shield. But in James chapter 4, look what it says here that we're to do. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The devil's a coward. You don't go attack the devil. You stand for the truth. And you resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. It says the devil is like a lion. Now, I've never been to Africa, but I knew a brother who was. 
And he told me that he learned a lot in Africa, especially about lions. If you ever run headlong into a lion, the last thing you do is turn around and run. Because lions are just like cats. They love to hunt and jump and, 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 and chase things. You ever seen a, a cat chase a squirrel or chase a rat? They love to chase after things and prance around, prance around and jump. Well, if you run from a lion, he's going to chase you, and he's going to jump right on top of you. So the thing you do is, if you ever come across a lion, is you slowly back away, and you face him the whole time. And you be ready to stand. And you need to have with you a spear. And if that lion comes running at you, you get down on one knee, and you plant that spear, and you say, Come on, buddy. And sure as the world, if he comes at you, he's going to jump. And when he does, you stick that spear straight up into his chest and let his own weight kill him and let him fall right on that spear and that's the power of standing it'll kill him you don't have to attack and run up to that line and go ah! because he'll jump he's good at dodging he's good at moving and you won't get him but if you stand and stick that spear he'll he'll put it right through his own heart he'll die right there in front of you so we that are Christians we're supposed to stand for the truth. And back to uh, Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll go ahead and finish this up. 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, Paul says, verse 19, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may, be, may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. That's what God wants, is what, us to boldly preach the gospel. And if we're standing for the truth and we have on the armor, it's easy. You know, the problem with many Christians is they're too scared. Many people contact me and say, I don't know what to do. I'm, just, I'm a new Christian and I'm, I'm afraid. Don't be afraid. Boldly go out and proclaim to the lost and dying world, you're going to hell and the gospel is this. Why don't you trust it and get saved? Don't care what they say. Just do it. They need to hear it and we need to preach it boldly. It's when we're not bold that they laugh and ridicule and make fun. But when we're bold, they look at you like, okay, I, I don't believe that, but I can tell you sure believe it, <laughs> because we're bold. Verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, I don't have time to take you to 2 Corinthians, where he says he's an ambassador of reconciliation and other things. Verse 21, but that ye also may know my affairs and how I do. Tychicus, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister. I always thought that was the funniest word. Or tickicus. It sounds like tickle, 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 tickicus, tickicus, tickicus. I mean, it's just, I'm sorry, that's just a funny word. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things. Well, what does he mean, all things? Well, all things that, that you need to know that, that, that I told him, he'll tell you. That's what he's saying. Verse 22, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that you might know our affairs and that you might have comfort in your hearts. Verse 23, Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Interesting here. Three things Paul says. Peace, love, and faith. How important is love? We started out talking about slavery and how they loved one another. How important is peace? What is the devil trying to do today? Get people to hate one another so that they'll fight each other. That's what he wants. He doesn't want peace. He wants war and faith. What does the devil want? He wants you to be confused and not believe in anything. He wants people to believe in nothing, but God wants faith. And verse um, 24, like the end of many of his epistles, he ends by saying grace. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. So we're saved by grace, but after we're saved, Paul says we should have grace. Well, that's one of the things that makes a man. You're not only saved by grace, but you learn how to have grace with others, learn how to put up others. You don't have to attack others. You need to stand for what's right. So that's Ephesians chapter 6. I believe next time we'll, we'll go to Philippians there and uh, finish that up. But I appreciate you all watching this. I hope it's a blessing to you. I've had many people contact me and say, we thank you so much. We're really learning the Bible through all of this, and it's really a blessing. Well, that's great. That's great. Now, what are you going to do about it? You know, it's one thing to just learn it and keep it in your heart. Forget about it. But what about sharing with others? That's what's so important. I don't just do this just for entertainment. I do this to help edify you 
in the hopes that you'll edify others. So I hope this is a blessing, and I hope that God will use it. And uh, maybe God will call you to the ministry. Not too long ago I did a, a video on how God called me into the ministry. Maybe that's what God wants for you. So just put God first. Put on the armor of God. Think about these things. Know what it is to be a man. And stand for the truth. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time as we start Philippians.